what, 20 years almost, right? It was 2001, I think, that we came about. And, well, in various forms. In various forms, and we've been through leadership here uh, several times, and, and many, many years ago, I was uh, the lay pastor for this church, and, and without it, even hurting my feelings, we were all praying for a real pastor to come along, that we might be able to, um, to grow and, and to move things out, and, and Pastor Tony came along. He, he joined us, and he became a part of our congregation, and, um, and there was three of us, the three musketeers. There was Tony and Greg and I. We miss Greg. We lost him um, recently uh, to cancer. One year ago. Tuesday. One year ago, Tuesday, yep. Uh, Greg was a Marine. I'm Navy. And Tony's the closest thing you can get to the military is the Air Force. <laughs> Sorry. Just kidding. And, uh, and we have remained uh, faithful to God through all of the hardships and the trials that we've had uh, to endure. And uh, um, I'm just ecstatic that Tony's back to preach a sermon for us today. I have missed him. We've not been able to get together much because of this whole COVID mess. But, um, um, but you know, God always sees fit to give us the things that we need when we need them. He never puts more in front of us than we can handle. You know, so, uh, Tony. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> excuse me. No, I have it here, thanks. Um, one of the things that this, um, this day and age has created is that it's given drive-by a whole new meaning. Um, we, my mother-in-law, who's at a uh, assisted living facility, um, she can't come out, uh, be around people, and we can't go in. And so what we do is uh, every now and then on Sabbath, we'll drive by, we'll open the van, we have a bunch of signs that says, hi, Johnny, how are you? And we yell, hi, hi. We'll talk to her from the van and then we'll drive away. And today we're gonna do the same thing because today's her birthday, so we're all gonna do a drive-by. Uh, and we did that with Frank and Susan uh, when Susan was under the weather. We went by and did a drive-by prayer. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. So, so the thing is, is that one nice thing about this whole thing is, is that it's causing us to be a little more creative as to how we're going to do things um, uh, for the Lord. And one thing I'm learning about this whole uh, COVID crisis is that. If you're having a hard time now, then you need to get ready because when the time of the end comes, it's gonna get worse than this, okay? Um, and one of the things that um, I'm learning and, and I'm learning to really truly embrace this, and that is that God is in control. Amen. I don't care what it looks like out there, okay? I don't care who is in charge of running this country. God is still in control. Amen. And whether you like it or not, God is still in control. And we have to learn to accept that aspect of it. Because if we don't, and maybe it would help if I turned my mic on. Right? Okay. okay. Now, now, can you hear me now? All right. <clears throat> So, and that's very important, especially during these, this time that we're living in. Because if you're gonna start a fight over something as trivial as this, then you're not ready for the second coming of Christ, okay? So it's important that we balance uh, our relationship with God, with what's going on in society, and which is one of the reasons why <clears throat> Sharon and I, when we get together in the mornings, we have worship uh, and we have prayer time when we have breakfast. And um, well, during one of our devotionals, I came up with this idea in one of the devotionals about your, pre your 
your perception, your perception, your perception, excuse me, your perception on things. And so then I started thinking about the fact that they, when I was reading, and if you want to go to chapter 9 of Matthew, you can, because that's where we're going to be at today. I noticed that within the nation of Israel, they had what I refer to as faulty perception filters. Okay? And that's what I want to address today, because I want to make sure that our filters are not getting faulty. Let us pray. Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity and this privilege of being able to speak your word. I ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit speak through me and that the words I speak give honor and glory to your name. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> now, back during World War II, there was a uh, gentleman uh, by the name of, he was a, an engineer for General Electric by the James, name of James Wright. And what he wanted to do is he wanted to create a rubber that was going to be something that they could use during the war. They wanted to be able to use something that was durable. And so what he did was he poured boric acid into a sil and silicon oil together and he produced this rubber. But what happened was that the rubber that he produced um, was good except that it didn't have the probabilities that he needed in rubber. And so he, said, he figured that this was not going to work. It was something he could stretch, he could mold it into shapes, and the amazing thing is, is that he took it and dropped it and it bounced. And so he, when he did this, he, it sort of really became more of a novelty thing. And so what he did is that when he would go to a, um, to a party, he would share this uh, invention of his with people. And one of the people that was at a party with him one time was a man by the name of Peter Hodge, Hodgson. And he was a person that was an advertising person. That's what he did. That was his profession. And he saw what this man was showing, that uh, James Wright was showing, and he saw something totally different. And what he did was he asked if he could use this. He was given permission. He tested the product to make sure it wasn't toxic. And after doing some initial testing, he introduced to the world Silly Putty. I mean, those of us who are a little bit more seasoned than others, we grew up with Silly Putty, okay? Uh, those who are not so young, I mean, those who are young, probably are wondering, what is that? Uh, but, but the thing is this, Silly Putty, became so popular that in 2005, they sold 10 million eggs of Silly Putty. So that goes to show you that this has gone on for a very long time because Silly Putty came out in the 50s. So the reason I present this to you is because I want you to understand this. In 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18, it says, The message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction, but we who are being saved know it is, very, it is the very power of God. Amen. And the reason I share this with you is because I want to help you to understand here that <clears throat> many of us, our perception of how we see the gospel, we're starting to let other things, exterior things, change the simplicity of how we once saw it. Okay? And what I want to do is I want to show you um, and I want to define for you these three words. Uh, faulty perception and filters. And then I want to give you a, a, a definition that I've kind of come up with, with what a faulty perception filter is. 
First of all, when something is faulty, it means that it's working badly or unreliably because of imperfections. There's something wrong with it, so that's why it's faulty. Then you have perception, the ability to see, hear, or become aware of something through the five senses. That's how we perceive things, right? Then you have filters, something that passes through a device to remove unwanted materials, okay? That's what it is. Now, what a faulty perception filter is when you apply it to spiritual things is defined this way. It is, um, it is a way of thinking that is unreliable because our senses have removed that which we consider, notice I said we, consider unessential for our biblical understanding. Now I'm going to show you that based on what the Word of God says. Because I want us to understand something. Just because the Bible teaches something and now we're in a uh, era where we understand things better does not mean that we cannot fall into the same problems that they had in the Bible times. Okay? I want to make sure that we understand that. And what this means is this, and I find this very interesting. Um, what this really means is your truth, my truth, and the truth. And I, and, and I found this definition online because in online they say there is, no, uh, there is no ultimate truth because it all depends on your perception. And I say no, there is truth. And I want to also share this with you. I found this very interesting. In many of the churches that I was in, I, I did a survey of, and I asked the question, as a Seventh-day Adventist, when you say, when we say we have the truth, what does that mean? And I passed out papers and everybody wrote their answers. I got dissertations from some people. Um, and, and I want you to understand something. The reason why I was not able to get the correct answer 100% it has to do partly with the fact that as Seventh-day Adventists, we have forgotten what our specific truth was or is. And that is the three angels message. When we used to say we have the truth, we were talking about the three angels message. Okay? It wasn't the Sabbath. Because, by the way, there are 550 and counting individual congregations that keep the Seventh-day Sabbath. There are also, we say, well, it's the health message. Well, are you aware that many of the New Age people keep the health message better than we do? You go online and you watch some of those online programs that they teach you how to eat, how to be a vegan. These aren't Christians. And, they, they, and they're preparing meals that are completely and totally healthy. So the idea is, and that's the whole idea behind that, your truth, my truth, and the truth. Within the Seventh-day Adventist Church, when we say the truth, we were referring to the three angels' message. <clears throat> that's what we were referring to. Jesus is, Jesus is the truth, the way and the life. Okay, that, There's no doubting about that. But as a church, this is what we were referring to. Now, something else I want to share with you, and this was, I shared this with my granddaughters last night because I wanted them to be able to get an idea about this. And it has to do with this. <clears throat> if I draw a giant six on the floor and I'm standing over here and you're standing back there and I ask you, and I say to you, that's a six. Well, from back there, you look at it and you say, no, it's not. It's a nine. And I say, no, it's a six. I can see it very clearly. And from where you're standing, it's no, it's a nine. 
And so begins our misunderstanding of things and says, and understand this, whatever our personal views are of how we should live as Christians will determine the way we perceive others should be living. <clears throat> so if I have determined that I must be doing A, B, and C, hence everybody who comes into my circle, into my sphere, must be doing A, B, and C. You cannot be doing anything otherwise because from my perception, that's the way you're supposed to be living. And, and that, by the way, is a faulty perception filter. And I will show you some more. <clears throat> if our perception filters are unhealthy, flawed, and distorted, and we view our world through this type of perception, then our view of a potential brother or sister in Christ will be distorted and flawed also. Now, I'm going to give you another perception filter that you need to take a look at. How many legs does that elephant have? That elephant has four legs. The individual who drew this created an image to make you think there were five. A faulty perception filter <clears throat> causes you to see things that are not there. Okay? One, two, three, four. You think this is one right here, but it's not. <clears throat> Okay? It, they make, it's distorting what's really there. And as Christians, we have to make sure that we do not allow anyone to distort what the Word of God says. Our senses are often unreliable. It is our job to know this and therefore question ourselves before we make a judgment call. I know personally, from my experience as a pastor, I've made a few judgment calls that were terrible, which were wrong. And of course, I paid the price for it because then when the truth was out, then I realized I was wrong. Perception is a tricky thing. What we think we see or believe may not necessarily be what is really there. Okay? And this is the one that I um, find very interesting. Here's another way of saying this. We don't see things as they are. We see things as we are. So hence, if we were trained to do this this way, if we were taught to do things this way, then that's the way everything has to be, even if somewhere along the way it was wrong. We kind of get stuck with it. Now, I, uh, I remember a conversation that I had <clears throat> when I, my, first, my very first district, as a pastor. And one of the things that we were doing, because this is what the church did back then, is that young people who were of um, baptismal age could not participate in communion if they had not been baptized. And it was part of Pathfinder training. In, in um, the, 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 the book, Something Path, that had to do with pathfindering. That was what they said. That ba a communion was only available to children who were baptized. But we allowed anyone who was visiting our church with their children to participate in communion. 
<clears throat> I said, there's something wrong with that. How is it that someone who doesn't know anything about Jesus Christ walks into our church, is allowed to participate, but our kids who are learning are not going to be allowed to participate? And that became a discussion because what they were saying is that the, they were taught that this is the way things were done. And so I was saying, I said, but don't you see the fallacy in that? And the question was, so then are you saying that what we were taught was wrong? And I stayed away from that one. I said to them, I said, reconsider it now. If these are our children and we want to teach them and we want them to know, shouldn't we as a church body teach them and allow them, but make sure they know? An interesting ha thing happened because I found out later, um, about maybe three years ago, one of the young men that I was before the board in defense of wanting to participate in this um, uh, communion service, but he hadn't been baptized yet because he wasn't of the eight, he wasn't old enough yet. I, he contacted me and notified me that he became a pastor. And he said it was because of what he learned from me and my wife back then. Amen. And he's a pastor in the Georgia Cumberland Conference. And I was like, you have no idea of the influence that you have on young people by coming to their defense for something that is spiritually correct. Okay? Now, what I want to do now is I want you to follow with me in Matthew chapter 9, and we're going to take a look at what this particular uh, section, uh, chapter, is talking about. And it is extremely, uh, to me, it was ex an extreme eye opener because of the fact that you read certain chapters in the Bible. And sometimes you never see certain things until you sit down one day and God opens your mind and you are able to see things that were like, I never noticed that. In one chapter, I never noticed all of this. And we start off looking at chapter 9, verse 1 of Matthew. And I'm reading from the New, from the New King James. And it says, so he got into the boat, crossed over, and came to his own city, and this is Jesus Christ now. Then behold, they brought to him a paralytic laying on a bed. When Jesus, and when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. Now, if you were to look in, um, in, in Luke and in Mark, you'll find these stories also in there. Mark brings out the fact that there were four friends who were helping, who, who, four friends who were helping this paralytic. In Luke, you find that these friends, and I had preached this here once before, and it was called, Who's Holding Your Rope? And he said there in Luke, you find that these friends began to disassemble another man's roof in order to get their paralytic friend into the presence of Jesus because there were so many people at the door, they couldn't get in. Now you have to ask yourself, do you have friends like that? Do you have friends who are willing to do whatever it takes to bring you into the presence of God when you need it? And in, this, and in this day and age, just the whole idea that you could call one of our church members at 3 o'clock in the morning and say you're having something, you, have, you had a bad dream, you need prayer. Amen. Amen. And, and I want you to know, having bad dreams as a devout Christian happens. I remember in Washington, I had a church member who had been in Vietnam. And he had spent two years in Vietnam. And he said that, he said, I, I, he was 
one of those people that you say, that's the kind of elder I want. And I was trying to get him to be an elder, and he kept telling me how he kept having those nightmares of the, when he was in Vietnam. And I told him, I said, that does not negate you from accepting Jesus and from doing his will. I said, we all have that problem. Every now and then we'll have a dream that we're like, whoa, I don't ever want to dream that again. And the good thing is, is that he did step forward and became an elder. And when he moved to another area of Washington, he actually went to the VA hospital and started serving at the VA hospital, helping other veterans, which was really good. But listen to this. There was a physical healing here of this paralytic, right? A physical healing. If you and I were sitting here right now and there was someone who was a paralytic or someone who had some kind of physical ailment or mental ailment and we prayed and that person was healed on the moment, would we not be shouting hallelujah? But here are the faulty perception filter people. Verse 3. And at once, some of the scribes said within themselves, this man blasphemes. They couldn't see beyond their traditions and the perceptions that they have created. Because God hadn't created those perceptions. They did. And now they couldn't see past them. Then it goes on, of course, Jesus then goes on to explain to them, but Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise and walk? Now that's a loaded question. They were not going to answer that one. Okay? They were not going to answer that one. And so then Jesus goes on to say, But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, and the, the Luke translation is the one that I really like because in that one, he says to him, get up! And I, I just love it, you know, because to me, it's not like Jesus said, okay, come on, arise, get up. There was more power to his voice at that point because he was casting out the demon of affliction that he had. <clears throat> and he says, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. And he arose and departed to his house. And then you have a praise the Lord moment. <clears throat> Verse 8. Now when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God who had given such power to men. Wow, this is, this is great. Do you see what God can do? They're having one of those moments where you get so beside yourself, you don't know what to do. You don't know, this is one of those, you don't know whether to stand, to sit, to praise, to, to bow, to cry. To, you don't know what to do because it's so exciting. It's so wonderful. This is what I would refer to as from, from the song, um, I Can Only Imagine by Mercy Me. This is one of those I can only imagine moments. So then it goes on to say in verse 9, as Jesus passed on from, from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. That right there is enough for people to say when they're walking with Jesus to see he just called a tax collector, someone that the Jews really considered a terrible person because you're doing this to your own people, that now he says, come follow me. The disciples should have been shouting, hallelujah, look at this. Matthew's going to follow Jesus now. Now it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And, and, and you, think, you, you see this, right? <clears throat> uh, uh, Christians sitting with a bunch of sinners. <gasps> How dare you? <clears throat> you can't do that. I mentioned to my grandkids last night, if all your friends are Christians, who are you going to reach for Christ? If all your friends are Christians. 
If all of your acquaintances are Christians, who are you going to reach for Christ? If you socialize with no one but Christians, who are you going to reach for Christ? And so here Jesus is mixing with tax collectors and sinners, and he's just having a good old time with them because he's feeding them the word of God. And then you find in verse 11, and here goes another one of those that I like to refer to as joy busters, but they're faulty perception filter people. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to, the, to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Why are you socializing with sinners? That's terrible. You missed the whole concept. You missed the whole purpose of why we are Jesus' followers. Because we want to share the word of God. We want others to hear the word of God. <laughs> when Jesus heard that, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. And all of us here can, can attest to the fact that we need a physician because we're all sick and we need the greatest doctor of all. But go and learn what this means. I desire money and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous but the sinners to repentance, which basically means everybody. That's who he has called. But because these Pharisees considered them to be more righteous than others, then apparently they were not the ones he was talking to. Jesus was referring to everyone who recognizes their need for a savior. And now they come up with another question in verse 14. And it goes on there to say, Then the disciples of, Jesus, of John came to him saying, Why do we... And the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast. And they get into a whole big question about whether or not you should or should not fast. And, and I remember that um, when I first became an Adventist, um, the church I was attending, Wednesday was fast day. Everybody in the church was being asked to fast on that day. But my, my question was, but for what? just to fast because I'm going to, because the church as a whole wants to fast. Fasting is supposed to be, there's a purpose for why we fast. Okay? And the thing is, is that not everyone can fast the same way. And so if you have a faulty perception filter, then if someone is taking medication, you're saying then you're not trusting in God because you're taking your medication when you should be fasting. You don't have my health condition in order to tell me whether or not I'm doing the right thing. You see how we get to the point where our perceptions start to get faulty because of things that we've learned, well, that everybody should be doing everything exactly the same way. No. God didn't create us to be robots. He didn't make us all the same. And I'm sure that none of you are going to be able to stand up here and speak with the eloquence that our brother Frank does. Now, I want to drop down to verse 18. And there it says, While he spoke these things to them, Behold, a ruler came and worshipped him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. Now, the interesting thing is, is that this story, it starts off here, that Jesus, got, this person, ruler came to him, okay? But you have to drop down to verse 23 to find out exactly that he answered that, that uh, request. Because in the middle, sandwiched in between all of that, is another story. And in there you find, in verse 20, And suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. 
For he said to her, he, for she said to herself, if only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well. She had so much faith in Jesus and what he represented. That all she said, all I have to do is touch him, and that's enough. Verse 22 then says, But Jesus turned around, and when he saw her, he said, Be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. Now this story, you'll find it in Mark and in Luke as well. And one of the things that is interesting in the other, version, uh, the, <clears throat> the other stories is that Jesus, when she touched him, Jesus felt, and I, I, I say that he felt her faith because he felt something. And he turned, and of course the disciples are like, what do you mean, who touched you? All these people are around you. Everybody's touching you. But nobody was touching him with the faith that woman had. So much so that Jesus felt the difference. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then it says that she was made whole. Now, the thing about this is that this woman, because of the ailment that she had, would be considered ritually unclean. And so it probably had been a very long time since anyone had actually hugged her. Think about the joy and the excitement in that woman now that she's healed and can go back home and be with her family. <clears throat> then you go to verse 23. It says, when Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the noisy crowd wailing, he said to them, make room for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him because they were like, what do you mean she's sleeping? She's dead. That's why we're here. And Jesus then goes on. But when the crowd was put outside, he went in and took her by the hand and the girl arose. <clears throat> the girl was once again alive. This, again, is one of those praise the Lord, hallelujah moments. <clears throat> now, in verse 27, when Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he had come into the house, the blind men came in to him. And Jesus said to them, Do you believe I am able to do this? In other words, you think I can do it? Do you think I can heal you? And they said, yes, Lord. Or as we would say, absolutely. Then he touched their eyes, saying, according to your faith, let it be to you. So their faith in their belief in Jesus healed their ailment. Now, I want to go to verse 32, and in this section here is the section which is basically would have been my scripture reading if, if we had done it earlier. And, and this is what it says in verse 32. As they went out, behold, they brought to him a man mute and demon-possessed. And when the demon was cast out, the mute spoke, and the multitudes marveled, saying, it was never seen like this in Israel. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever been around a demon-possessed person. Um, <clears throat> when I was a, a young elder in the church in Puerto Rico, I was asked by the pastor to join him because we had to go pray for a sister who had become demon-possessed. The family had called the pastor and asked them to come there. And so we went there, and I have never been so fearful of a human being as I was that day. 
But the whole time, I prayed, I was praying to God to help me. And it took four grown men just to be able to hold her down. And the pastor prayed over her, and I actually remember hearing her go, And she got up and was trying to figure out what we were all doing there. Verse 34 is one of the most incredible in this chapter perception, uh, faulty perception individual filters that I have read in this. After witnessing blind men and demon possessed Healed by Jesus Christ. They turn around and says, But the Pharisee said, He casts out demons by the ruler of demons. They could not see the goodness of what he was doing. And, and, and I shared this with you because one of the things that <clears throat> sometimes um, we as... Christians, sometimes we, we sort of lose our focus because we're, we, we've been taught this is how it is. And anything outside of that box now is, well, that's bad because it's outside of the box. And one of the things that we have to do, especially in these times, understand something. When, when church resumes back to normal, it won't be normal. Church, the whole church experience is going through a transformation right now. And understand something. When I refer to all of these things, I am not in any way, shape, or form advocating a change of our doctrines. That has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is how we do church. And I'm talking about how we perceive others and the way they do church. If we stay focused on how we're doing church here, we have enough to worry about right here. Instead of worrying about what's going on over there and what's going on over there. <clears throat> I'm going to give you the story to give you the ultimate explanation of what a faulty perception filter can do. I was reading a story by uh, Elizabeth Talbert, and um, she has a TV series called uh, Jesus 101 on, um, on um, I forgot, Hope Channel. And in it, she, she shared this story in my family, we often refer to a story about two men involved in an animated argument about an item in a store. One of them believed it was a bar of soap, while the other insisted it was a piece of cheese. They continued to argue until the cheese proponent decided to take a bite to prove his perspective. It tastes like soap, but it's definitely cheese. <laughs> Do you see how sometimes we refuse to see things from another perspective because we insist that it has to be the way we see it? If we find, as a church, ourselves questioning or speculating the wonders of God, perhaps it's because our filters have become faulty. This could be happening because you are seeing things filtered with pharisaical eyes and not spiritual eyes. It has been my experience that when this starts to happen, it is because we need to return to the basics. And the basics are, Jesus, tell me again for the first time. Because many times 
We complicate the simplicity of the gospel. Ac repent, accept, believe. And many times what we do to ourselves is that we begin to create all these different things and before too long we start to look like the Jewish people the Jewish leaders who began to create all of these different things about the Sabbath well you can't do this you can't do that can't do this can't do that can't do this can't do that and before too long you get to the point where there's nothing you can do because everything is is forbidden and so my what I want to share with you today and leave with you is we need to return to a simplicity of the gospel so that we can once again be able to see Jesus through, through the message of Jesus Christ through spirit-filled eyes and not pharisaical eyes. Lord, thank you so much for providing this message for us. And I, Lord, for one, want to make sure that I am seeing your gospel, your message through spirit-filled eyes and that I not lose the simplicity of what it is. And I pray, Lord, that you help me to serve you, not just today, but every day that you grant me life on this earth, I ask and pray this all in Jesus' most worthy name. Amen.